uh, tell you some uh, recommendation in in this in this hub. Uh, you have uh, all the speakers 15 minutes to presentation. After that, uh, there are five minutes for question. And remember, in in this case, uh, we uh, I tell you when you only have two minutes for the end of your presentation. Uh, in this, uh, when the first uh, speaker is Luis Gerardo Trujillo. Uh, Luis Gerardo, could you pl uh, please uh, share your presentation? Yes, here we go. Um, uh, the button of sharing screen is not activated. Ah, I can see it. Thank you. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, I can see. Uh, you... Is the yes. presentation on screen? Mm, yeah, but it's not. Uh, in this case, you uh, put your presentation in in, in full oh, screen. In presentation uh, over. Give me one second. I oh yeah. Uh, oh no. In this case, it's, I I I see your oh yeah already. Uh, this is my presentation, but I cannot make it full screen. I I don't know why. Uh, give me one second. Maybe when you uh, uh, control share your, your screen. Okay. Maybe uh, oh yeah, it's it's, it's a full screen now, it's right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, can I start? Yes, uh, you you can. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am going to present uh, this. This topic about on the evaluation of low-cost piezoelectric sensors in model testing, a case study, on behalf of the authors, um, Luis Gerardo Trujillo. Uh, we are going to have a brief introduction to, to, the, uh, to the case study, and we are going to present a brief, in a brief manner, uh, our case study in order to present you the main points about it. Uh, we are going to present some numerical results in order to contrast them with the experimental results. We are going to talk about the main results we have obtained in this evaluation of piezoelectric sensors. Uh, we are going to present a results comparison and finally some conclusions. I'll reference are only for for reference for in order to cite the authors that we can um, uh, about the uh, about the the topic. Well, uh, we are going to present some results about the application of piezoelectric sensors in experimental model analysis. Uh, we have uh, some assumptions to make uh, when we are performing experimental model analysis. Um, the main the main assumption is that the structure will be considered linear. Uh, this is a uh, one important assumption because. We need uh, the system to be linear in order to to use a, a very successfully experimental model analysis. Uh, we are going to consider that the structure is constant over time, is la is is linear and time invariant. Uh, the structure is going to obey Maxwell's reciprocity. Uh, we consider this important uh, because of the nature of experimental model analysis. Uh, if the structure is considered observable. Uh, these are some important assumptions. Uh, there are no limitations of the experimental model analysis, but in this work, we need to make that assumptions for the well function of our sensor uh, proposal. Uh, well, um, there are two main options when performing experimental model analysis. Uh, one of them is to make uh, the direct uh, displacement related uh, measurements as velocity displacement and acceleration uh, so we we can use uh, the conventional sensors as accelerometers um even doppler based laser laser vibration uh, sensors uh, but uh, on the other hand uh, there is an approach based on the strain measurements 
we can only use strain measurements to perform experimental model analysis, but it has a main disadvantage of the usually the um, strain measurements are quite noisy. So we we need to, to take some special considerations in the uh, signal conditioning, but there are uh, interesting uh, options of performing experimental model analysis. In this work, we are going to present uh, this part. Uh, we are going to, to propose a technique based on strain measurements. Uh, to perform strain, maze, strain model analysis, uh, we use piezoelectric sensors. The piezoelectric sensors um, are used uh, are used uh, commonly to pick up pick up acoustic signals like violins, guitars. Uh, these sensors are, are uh, widespread used to convert mechanical vibration signals to electrical ones. Uh, piezoelectric materials are very stable, um, are very temperature stable and are used as acoustic transducers, as, as, I, uh, as I used to mention. Uh, the buzzers or beepers are the, the most common applications of piezoelectric transducers. Uh, piezoelectric transducers can generate acoustic signals, and at the same time, they can pick up uh, uh, acoustic signals. Uh, they have a, a tool, a tool mode of application, in this work, we are going to apply uh, the piezoelectric transducers as sensors, as, as sensors of strain. Um, they are very discreet. Uh, they are very discreet. Uh, they are light. They are uh, very attractive to be applied in experimental model analysis because of the frequency range effective of they offer. Uh, well, we are going to present the case study uh, in this. In this, in this work, we used a computer, a desktop computer cabinet in order to evaluate the performance of the piezoelectric sensors in experimental model analysis applications. We have a desktop computer cabinet. Uh, we have the, the model in the software uh, by means a uh, three-dimensional uh, drawing of the of the desktop cabinet. We try to, to keep in mind all the details as possible, all the details of the cabinet, including um, ventilation holes and cooling holes, um, all the details uh, as possible. We can export this CAD uh, to the finite element software. Uh, some some questions, some important remarks about the piezoelectric sensor used in this work are the size, uh, resonance frequency. Uh, we can see that um, high frequency is the better, the better bandwidth to use these sensors. Uh, they are very light. Um, they are they are discrete in in terms of size. Uh, an important characteristic of piezoelectric sensors is that they deliver high amplitude voltage and low current and a low current output but very high amplitude uh, output um, in presence of small impulse uh, this is very important because this simplifies in a considerable way the complexity of the um, signal condition system needed to use these sensors in experimental model analysis. Uh, the high amplitude is very useful when performing uh, model analysis. Uh, here we have uh, the first four most shapes of the cabinet. Uh, here we present the displacements, um, the mode shapes in terms of displacements, and we can see the four uh, resonant shapes very small shapes of the cabinet. As we can see, the, the frequencies are in a bandwidth of the use of the piezoelectric sensor because the piezoelectric sensor is set to, to be used in acoustic applications to 20 to 20,000 kilohertz, so we are in range. 
uh, for these applications. Uh, here we have a, a brief comparison between results of applying three, di three different materials to the CAD, to the structure, uh, to the model of the finite element model, and we can see uh, a very light variation of the of the natural frequencies, uh, except for the aluminum. So the aluminum was uh, deleted, was considered not not adequate for for this for this model. So we use stainless steel and structural steel to model the the desktop computer cabinet. Uh, here we have the experimental setup. We used um, a standard uh, data acquisition car. Um, we was set up uh, in a sampling rate of 500 kilohertz. And we have two options. We have um, a traditional accelerometer based on integrated electronics, IEPE accelerometers, and the other the other experiment was performed by using the piezoelectric sensors as transducers in similar positions. For the uh, model testing, we we use the uh, impact hammer testing. Mm, we use the uh, different points to apply the impact in the case of the the accelerometer measurements and a similar approach to use the piezoelectric sensors. Uh, it's important to mention that the the um, output of the piezoelectric sensor was directly connected to the data acquisition card uh, with no necessity of some signal conditional signal conditioning circuit. This is very important to mention because of the characteristic of the piezoelectric sensor. There is no need to signal conditioning. The directly connected to the a direct acquisition card. Uh, we, uh, we can see that the output delivered by the piezoelectric sensors of the three of them is very satisfactory, is very high. Uh, two volts, two volts are very high. Uh, we are uh, talking about sensors. Uh, two volts is a very considerable amplitude, so we can use them directly to perform um, the signal processing in order to extract model parameters. Uh, the sampling frequency in this case was set to 20,000 kil 20, hertz, uh, 20 kilohertz. In order to to acquire the signal, we can see that the, it, it is very, <clears throat> very large amplitude. Uh, we can compute then the FRFs. Uh, these FRFs uh, correspond to the um, acceleration measurements. We can see a, a very good. Uh, signal to noise radio. Um, we can see that the structure is lightly damped and this is the result of applying uh, the model analysis using the accelerometer uh, measurements. Uh, what about the results obtained with the uh, PS electric sensor? We can see that um, it's very it's very clear. It's, it's a, it has a very good uh, signal to noise ratio, but the main difference is in the damping. The damping is is going to be uh, a little more difficult to obtain uh, compared to the those obtained with um, acceleration measurements. But uh, in general, the performance of the piezoelectric sensor is is quite good. We can pick up, we can pick uh, all the model parameters uh, at least on natural frequencies with a very, very good performance. Uh, there we have uh, some comparison of results, uh, experimental results obtained by using the acceler accelerometer and the piezoelectric sensor, and we have a very satisfactory difference. Uh, the main difference uh, is uh, in the low frequency bandwidth because of the construction, because of the acoustic nature of the piezoelectric sensor, but in general it has a good performance uh, considering the the simple setup that we use to to prove the the performance of the sensor. So we can we can see that the results in experimental analysis is is very satisfactory. 
Well, uh, uh, from the experimental results, we can observe that the performance of the isolated sensor is, is quite good, but uh, it's important to consider that it's going to be better in the acoustic and the acoustic bandwidth. Um, the main limitation of the model analysis technique by excitation is the, that it, 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 necess it, it needs a lot of practice. It, it's easy to, to make mistakes. Um, it is recommended to carry out several tests in order to have better results. Those are considerations of the nature of the impact camera model testing. Uh, nothing to do about it. But in general, it's a very portable technique uh, and it's a, a very easy to, to perform technique once we can uh, acquire the necessary experience. Uh, some conclusions that uh, we obtain with, with this work is that piezoelectric sensors in the presentation of acoustic disc are very good, are very good to, to use in applications where um, we need to, to put the sensor and fix them to a structure. Uh, it's a cost-effective uh, option to perform experimental model analysis. Um, the piezoelectric sensors have an excellent response, especially in the amplitude, in the amplitude of the voltage they deliver. Um, finally, uh, these experimental results suggest that uh, the better positions are regions where the strain is high. Um, this, this result can give us the idea to use them in uh, structural health monitoring ap applications because of these characteristics. It's important to mention that the main disadvantage of this approach is precisely that uh, the piezoelectric sensors do not have um, a calibration certificate uh, compared to the calibration certificates offered by the um, acceleration, the professional acceleration measurement equipment offer. Um, this is going to be all for this presentation. Thank you very much for your for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Luis Gerardo, for for your presentation. Uh, is uh, is now to the section of, of the question. There, uh, the in the in the room, there are any question for for uh, Luis Gerardo oh, on the virtual room. the virtual room, uh, uh, you can uh, raise your hand if you have a question for uh, Luis Gerardo. I. I have a question for you, Luis Gerardo. Yes. Uh, can can I can I use this uh, sensor in any structure, or there are some specification, for example, only the uh, the plane surface? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Uh, it depends on the shape of your application. Uh, the limitations are, uh, of course, uh, size, size, uh, and you you have mentioned a very important detail. Uh, they are designed to be located at plain, at, at, at plain shape uh, uh, structures or or the part of the structure that is plain, as a plate, as a um, chassis, for, for example. Oh, yeah. In this case, uh, what material do you use for uh, bonded these these uh, sensors? Oh, uh, we uh, we use the cyanoacrylate. Cyanoacrylate oh, yeah. is a very common uh, glue, uh, glue gluing material. Yes, for this application, mm -hmm. uh, it's important to mention that there is a critical factor to uh, attach correctly the the sensor to the structure. Uh, your observation is is quite quite important. Um, we use this, we use this cyanoacrylate and. Uh, give us uh, good results, acceptable results. Oh yeah, but what happened with do you? You can use uh, this sensor in in uh, all uh, in this case when you have high vibrations in uh, a long time. 
the, this this uh, material on this case uh, this uh, uh, flu or glue uh, maybe you you have uh, some uh, performance as a uh, fragile material yes yes you are you're right uh, this this glue is adequate uh, only for for modal testing but in order to use this uh, this application these sensors in um, structural health monitoring approaches we need to use a, a better glue in order to compensate uh, the elasticity the elasticity of, of the of the glue of the attachment to the structure uh, we we need uh, to use a a more elastic elastic uh, compound mm. uh, is there any question for uh... Luis Gerardo? No? Uh, thank you, Luis Gerardo, for your presentation. A big applause for you. Thank you very much. We continue with the next uh, presentation. Uh, the next presentation is given by uh, Osvaldo. Yes. Uh, yeah. hello, Are you ready, Osvaldo? Uh, could you yes. please uh, share your presentation? Can you give me your uh, permission for share my screen, oh. please? Uh. Luis, Luis Gerardo, you, do you uh, please uh, give you permission? Or um, all... Okay. Uh, oh, uh, is, is it ready? Yeah, yes. it's ready. Okay. Are you ready? Uh, yes. Yeah? yes. Go ahead, uh, uh, Osvaldo, with your, with your presentation. Thank you, Doc. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. I'm Osvaldo Rufino, the main author of the article that I will talk to you about today. The name of this research is a Structural Head Monitoring in the Assembly of the Trojan Box and the Semi-Wing. Together with Oscar Garcia, we were low to the postgraduate department of the uh, Aeronautical University in Querétaro. Let's start. First, we are going to look at all the important points that we will teach in today. We will start with a short introduction to the basic concept of structural hair monitoring. Then we will talk about past research and important theoretical concepts. After that, we are going to show you how the experimentation was on on the prototype and how we did the simulation test with the help of finite element method. Finally, we are going to talk about the general conclusions. The structural hair monitoring is a special technique that is used to detect damage in a mechanical system in operation and environmental stage. As we can see in the figure one, uh, for this, a study structure is needed. In some cases, actuators, sensors, a system data acquisition, and a software for intelligent data processing. We can also identify four levels of scope, the detection of the damage, its location, the definition of the damage and how the damage propagates. And finally, we can make add the prediction of the remaining full useful life of the mechanical system. Speaking of the aerospace industry, one of the problems that airplanes have is the loss in preload in screw joints. This can be caused by errors in the assembly processes, or it can be due, due to dynamic loads. As we can see in the video one, sometimes when a system enters in a resonant frequency, it causes the loss of the screw joints. Now we will see part of the investigations. In the year uh, 2003, these authors used experimental model analysis techniques to detect the loss of rivets in a prototype of an airplane queen with the help of piezoelectric sensors. On the other hand, in 2010, some authors in China began to use the natural frequency vector as a parameter to identify damage in structures. They use experimental and numerically uh, methods as seen in the figure two. Other articles were made in 2016, in the first of which fractures, cracks, and the lamination in a wind turbine were identified. 
with the help of methods such as operational model analysis. And the other article, a prototype of the union between the fuselage and a wing of an aircraft to detect damage using piezoelectric sensors. A hydraulic actuator and a special fracture mechanics software was used. The figure three shows the actuator and the position of the sensors. Well, we start with the basic theory. We can uh, represent a system with multiple degrees of freedom with a specific degree of integrity with equation one, which is the equation of a system with free vibration without damping, where M and K are the mass and stiffness matrices, and X to dot and X are the acceleration and position vectors. When we solve the equation through the finite element method, we can now the equation two where X are the matrix of the vibration modes of the system and omega is the natural frequency vector. Uh, we can also express the natural frequency in Hertz. As the system, system has multiple degrees of freedom, it will have multiple natural frequency as seen in the equation three. Finally, we can say that the natural frequency depends on the stiffness and mass of the system, as shown in the equation four and five. We can say that if we change any structural parameter of a system, such as its mass, uh, stiffness, or damping, we will change its dynamical response, such as natural frequency, damping, and vibration modes. NFBAC measures the degree of linearity between two natural frequency vectors. In the case of the equation six, FI represents the undamaged natural frequency vector, and FI Asterisk represents the damaged natural frequency vector. If this concept is equal to unit, we can say that there is no damage because the vectors of the healthy and damaged states are equal. But if the value is between zero and one, there will be possible be damage. Uh, as it's numerically and experimentally almost impossible to always measure the same natural frequency vector, NFBAC is not enough. With the help of the NFBAC of the equation seven, we can now have the higher resolution in the result. When the NFBAC is close to zero, the structure has great a huge damage. And, and if the value is close to plus infinity, the damage is less, is, is less severe. Now we begin with the development of the methodology. We previously did an experimental platform it's a prototype that shows, in a simple way, what the assembly of the central torsion box and a main beam of the wind of an airplane is like. In order to obtain the natural frequency, an ADX L335 accelerometer was used, an Arduino tool to obtain the data, a linear solenoid to excite the structure, and a lab to process the data. Its final structure can be seen in the figure four. To have a reliable reference, uh, the natural frequency were also obtained with professional equipment. In the table one, shows the first five natural frequency of the system. Uh, it's important to mention that for our low cost equipment has a bad width of 800 Hertz. Uh, the type of damage study is the loss on preload in voltage joints or the complete loss of one or more joints. To better explain, uh, we are also going to see how the experimental platform is made up. We have the support structure, which allows experimentation to be carried out anywhere. Then there are the looks of the torsion box that are assembled with four M12 screws with a torque of 12 newtons meter. After that, we have two looks of the main beam of the semi wing are connected to the looks of the torsion box with two M12 screws with a torque of 10 newtons meter. Finally, the main beam is assembled with the two looks of the semi wing with eight M8 screws, which they have a torque of four newtons meter. Thanks to a torqueometer, we can control the torque of each joint. The damage we studied was centered in the upper look of the semi wing. For example, if we reduce the torque on a single joint to two newtons meter, we will have a damage of 12.5%. If we remove a joint, there will be a damage of 25% and so on. In order to identify each screw of the main wing uh, look, 
a nomenclature like one C in the figure five was used. The first step of the experimentation is the numerical simulation. In SOLIDWORKS, in your case, we must modify the CAD model. We must eliminate the dimensional tolerance that were created for manufacturing. In the screws and nuts, we must modify the geometry. The screws must be cut in two, in the stem and in the head. And in ANSYS, in the side modeler, we must join the two parts of the screws and first select a static analysis. In the engineering data part in ANSYS Workbench, we select the material. Aluminum alloy for the looks and beam, structural steel for screws and nuts, and copper alloy for the washers. In ANSYS Mechanical, we modify the contacts. Only the connection between nut and screw must be rigid. The others can be with friction. It's not a problem. For the machine, exhideral elements were used where possible, as an example in the screws and in other simple parts. In the other parts, it's fine with the tetrahedral elements. It's necessary to put uh, two low steps in ANSYS options. External forces, we must set the prelob for each screw. As we have the torque, we must use the formula T equal KF DID where T is the torque applied to the joint, KF is a constant which for unlubricated screw is 0 0.3, FI is a preload force, and D is the nominal diameter of the screw. We just have to solve for FI. Finally, in results, we can request the equivalent stress to observe the sphere option of the preload and the normal stress to compare with the analytical, analytic, analytical results. After completing the static analysis in ANSYS workbench, we create a model analysis with the static analysis of pre-stress condition. We only have to indicate how many vibration modes are of interest to us in the analysis options and in the results request the total deformation for each one of the cases. When the structure has no damage, when it, it has 12.5% damage, 25% damage, and so on. The figure 12 it shows the behavior of the three vibration mode. In the table two, we can see that as the damage progresses, some natural frequency are affected, some decrease, and other increase in value. Using the NFBAC and DNFBAC damage indices with the data from the table two, we obtain the following two graphs. In the graph one, we can see that the changes in the natural frequency are visible only with 100% damage. In other uh, words, when there is no any join in the upper lock. However, in the graph two, the damage is quantified in a better way. For practical purposes, we can say that it's possible to detect damage from 25% because when there is 12.5% damage, the frequency almost don't change. It might be due to errors in the solution. On the other hand, in the experimentation, in the real model, first with the professional equipment, 30 tests were carried out, only reducing the preload in a single joint to two newtons meter. In other words, with 12.5% damage. In theory, with this hardware, we can have a better sample reads for which better that. As can be seen in the table three, the peak picking method was used to obtain data such as uh, natural frequencies, uh, peak amplitude, damping, and the modal constant. It was observed that for natural frequency below 800 Hz, there were no significant changes. Cases with a huge damage have to be studied with the low cost equipment. With the low cost equipment, the progression of the loss of, loss of the four joints was studied. As in the figure 15, uh, they were removed one by one until there was 100% damage to the joint. Uh, 30 samples were taken only in the frequency 2 and 3, and a small statistical study was carried out to observe that the samples in all cases were a normal data. In fact, e this was the case. So the data errors were not a huge impact for the results. In the same way that with the simulation part, the average data of one of the samples was taken and the damage criteria were applied. 
We can observe that in general, there is a similar behavior that numerically with NFBAC, the damage is visible up to 100% damage. And for DNFBAC, the damage is visible up to one, uh, the damage from 25% uh, is very well identified. We can say that the parameter is growing with the small damage. Finally, now let's start with the general conclusions. Uh, first of all, it's important to mention that to affect the natural frequency in a structure, uh, we need to change the boundary conditions because in this way you uh, you are modify the stiffness of the system. Also, it's important to say that the natural frequency, unlike other dynamic characteristics, for example, model shapes, are easier to measure. This is advantage for hardware and programming development. As we could see in the graphs, DN FBAC is a damage indices so useful for identifying different damage states and these damage detection techniques based on changes in natural frequency are very useful in experimentation and simulation studies. Comparing the experimental and uh, numerical results in the table 6, we observe that there is a difference in the data but the behavior in general is similar. To improve the results, it's necessary to test different boundary conditions in ANSYS and improve the data acquisition system. Finally, we have the reference used during the presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, I can answer them. Or if you prefer, you can send me your question to my email present on the slide. Again, thank you very much. Thank you, Osvaldo, for your presentation. Uh, it's time for your question. Uh, any anybody have a question for Osvaldo? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, go ahead, doctor. Osvaldo, uh, how the structural dumping can affect your results? I mean, uh, how the structural dumping? Because uh, I could I couldn't see anything about the dumping uh, related in your results. Uh, yes, it's a good question. Uh, in this moment, me and Oscar, uh, we are centering in the study in the natural frequency, but uh, we did some cases, special cases like like the damage with 12.5% uh, of damage in the upper lock. In this case, we apply the peak picking method. We can observe that for the cases of the damping ratio, constant modal, and the peak amplitude, we have uh, interesting changes uh, with a small damage. But for example, in the case of the uh, structures like the union between the torsion box, uh, the, the central torsion box and the semi window airplane, it's too important to identify that, that the important problem is the loss <laughs> of one or more screw. So for that, uh, maybe it's not important in this moment to detecting uh, a small damage, since uh, by um, I means that it's better to go to the natural frequency because it's easier to measure this uh, characteristic of the system, and in the case for the uh, uh, other characteristic like the peak amplitude, etc., it's not not necessary in this case. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Another question. In case of cracks, because most of the cracks in uh, structural elements are have a nonlinear uh, behavior, uh, how can this nonlinear behavior can affect your uh, indices? Yes. Uh... In other articles that we are we were a, a study during the uh, the master in the school, uh, we observed that in these cases uh, the authors using uh, new types of concepts like the uh, uh, in, uh, artificial intelligence, for example, or maybe uh, it's necessary to use other other ways like. Uh, uh, having a lot of different data for cre uh, creating a, a special algorithm. 
but in, in the case of voltage uh, voltage joints, it's necessary to to recognize the structure as a nonlinear structure. Uh, thank you, Osvaldo, for your presentation. A big applause for you. Thank you. Gerardo, could you please uh, uh, introduce the next uh, speaker? Yes. Uh, our next speaker is um, speaker is Enrique Hernandez, where he's going to present a work entitled A Cascade Constraint MPC Scheme for the Speed and Current Control of an Induction Motor Drive. In English, no? Yes, yes, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I don't know why it, it cannot be seen the first uh, the first slide. Ah, there you go. My name is Omar. I come from the Autonomous University of Hidalgo State. And this work is as, um, is developed by uh, one student of master degree. Um, and it's related to model predictive control for an induction motor. With a, a, a brief introduction of the presentation, an introduction, the mathematical model, our proposal, simulation results, and some conclusion. So we are currently working with induction motors. Induction motors are um, the most widely used motor in industry application. Applications such as the pumps, the conveyors, and fans. Then uh, industrial motor. This this kind of industrial motor is widely used, and we typically want to optimize the energy consumption. For energy consumption, we use some control that we know as field-oriented control (FOC). That is that is. To, that we see in this image. Pilarital control has this, this structure where you can see that this control is based on linear controllers. Most of the time, are linear controllers, such as PI controllers. Uh, we have a case care structure where we have an outer loop for the state, um, sometimes an outer loop for the, for the position, and we have uh, an inner loop for the coherence. Um, this this type of controller results in a, something something similar like controlling a DC motor. That's the basic idea of, of this structure. The problem is that when you turn your your PI controller and you change the um, the reference speed, you need to recalculate the gains so that you don't lose some robustness and and you keep your 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 system work uh, in in a, in a better way. Uh, uh, in this work, we are currently developing something that we are interested. In. We want to 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 develop a control that uh, is capable of rejecting disturbances in the speed of the machine, and we are interested in uh, keeping that control over the operational constraint of the system. That we we propose a constraint and discrete time continuous model predictive control that we are going to we are going to present. Uh, model predictive control is obviously based on the model of the system. The, this is a very well known model of, for the induction motor in something that we could be reference frame, where we have equations that describe the electrical part and equations that describe the mechanical part. So this is the model that we're going to be using. It's a nonlinear model, and to reduce the computational burden in the model predictive control, we linearize it. We use a feedback linearization. Then by using these actual, uh, these uh, actual variables, 
we can have uh, a state space model for the current of, of the system. And we can do the same in, in the case of the speed to obtain a linear model. We are currently not working in flux weakening mode. So on the flux weakening, we suppose that the rotor flux is constant, uh, constant and it's, just, um, it's almost always in the nominal value. So by taking that supposition, we can take the, the linear model. Once we have the linear model, since a model the control is a discrete controller, we discretize it and we use, mm, for simplicity, every forward method. And to reject disturbance in the, in the system, we add an integrator. Then by adding an integrator, we have the structure of our anometric system that is given by equation 11. Once we have the model, we can start developing the control. Um, and here you go. This is our, our proposal. Uh, we can see that we basically take everything, uh, each block of FOC, we take all the blocks, and we are replacing the linear controllers by a cascade structure of model predictive controllers. One MPC for the speed of the machine and one MPC for the currents of the machine. Then we have these two, two controllers uh, to be developed. For simplicity, we consider that obviously the, the state variables are measurable and they are available for feedback. Our, our reference are constant over the prediction of of the controller. Also, the rotor flux is constant uh, and the parameters of the machine are constant. They are not changing over time. First, to, to, to develop the model predicted control, we need to obtain a prediction of the system. The prediction of the system is taken from system uh, 11 and we solve it iteratively, iteratively and we can take uh, this expression 12. We can see that the prediction is based on the parameters of the system and the control trajectory. Our objective now is to develop this control trajectory. Mm -hmm. First, we take the, the speed control design. What we want to do is to is to force the, the, the velocity of the machine to the reference, and to do that, we propose an optimal control. Uh, then we define a cost function. The cost function introduced is this equation 14, and we can see that what we have is a reference tracking problem where we want to take the, the speed of the machine to the reference. Taking this, this cost function, what we want to do is to minimize it so that we can then um, we can solve for the optimal control. This is done by formulating a constraining optimization control that is in equation 15. And we can see that to, to solve this problem, we have the cost function that has been rewritten using the output prediction, and these are the, the parameters. And we have uh, some constraints that are given by this uh, inequality equation along the trajectories of the system. The inequality construction are the limits or the control. In this case, is the current of the machine. And to calculate that, that constraint, we take the, um, the torque equation of the motor that is given by this expression. And once we, once we have this expression, we can calculate the upper limit of the control and the lower limit of the control. Then these two are those, those are some constraints that are added to the optimization problem. We do something similar to the current. In this case, what we want to do is that the current of the machine follow the desired reference. We also introduce a cost function. In this case, it's already written in the form that we will obtain after replacing the, the output trajectory here. And, and we also have a, a trajectory tracking problem. Once we have the, the um, the cost function rewrited. We also formulate a quadratic optimization problem that is given by this equation. It's the same idea that the speed controller. The only difference is that now the control delta u is the is the total voltage of the machine. To calculate now these constraints that uh, we are interested now, we use the uh, this equation 20, where we can solve for the upper limit of the controller of the stator current of stator voltage and the lower limit of the stator voltage. Then once we have this, we can uh, 
uh, try to, to simulate this. We use simuli to perform the simulations. This is these are the parameters of the machine. Of the machine. This is a commercial a commercial motor, and we 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 have here our parameters for the simulation. Sample time for the feed is 300 microseconds. Sample time for the current is 100 microseconds. These are the parameters on both MPC controllers. And we basically have taken them by try and, and, and error. So far, we don't know uh, a method to calculate these, these parameters analytically. And to solve uh, the quadratic problem optimization, we use Hildex, uh, Hildex algorithm. Index algorithm is just uh, is think it, um, to to perform in real time and it's a fast server for could could be problems. And here are the results. We can see that um, when we do the reference tracking of the speed, we obtain a good result. Here we have some perturbation of the system, and when we add the perturbation, the lower torque of the machine, the control is capable of mitigating the effect. And follow with the, the reference speed uh, successfully. Uh, we made a comparison with a pay control. Pay control is one of the most widely used in electrical machines. And we can see that similar uh, similar results are, are obtained. However, we have some kind of ripple on the torque of the machine that is mainly our, our, main, our main difference. Uh, we now can see the um, the current control response, where we have the current and the current, and the start of voltage, USQ and the US stick. And we can see that these controllers are um, limited by the constraints imposed on the system. Mm -hmm. We also have the results for the PI controller in this case. We can see that these are similar results where we can see the difference is that uh, is on the ripple of the current. We can see that these currents present bigger ripples compared to the MPC. And finally, to, to evaluate this numerically, we made a measurement of the load minutes per error, where we can see that there is no uh, a very huge difference, but MPC is slightly better than the PEGI control. And, and finally, as, as, as a, some con conclusions, we can say that we present an MPC strategy for the regulation of the speed and current of an induction motor. This is based on a constrained optimal control problem that guarantees system, the operation of the induction motor according to the operational limits. We add an integrator that is thinking to, to add some robustness to the controller against external disturbance. And we have verified these results in the other transient state and compared with other control schemes resulting in, a, in, a, in an accurate performance. Mm -hmm. And that would be all for me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a question. Oh, thank you very much to the speaker for his presentation. If someone has a question, it's time to to make to make it. And also, if someone in the virtual room wants to ask a question to the speaker can participate using the hand icon <laughs> so i'm the only person here <laughs> yeah i have to to make some questions okay now uh first of all, of all uh why mpc and why the discretization of the induction model induction model one I mean, because your sample times are very like, fast, uh, and I was wondering about okay, but uh, are just about one kilohertz, uh, or a fraction of one kilohertz. Yes, the, so how did it connected with the model PC and your the discretization of your model? Uh, yes, it's the third white MPC because we. We are trying to develop some um, control that is capable of adding constraints in the design. Mm -hmm. I I don't know if it is possible with other scale, but that's our main interest. Um, sample time using or whatever method because it is just, uh, how to say it, is low computational yeah. burden because that's already something expensive, and we want to do that on a low cost uh, embedded system. So we don't want to be that uh, that the embedded system is maybe more expensive than the motor. Yeah. So that's not a practical solution. 
So that that we resolved and it will work because something that is very small compared to the yeah. to the dynamic response. Yeah, but that that's the main reason. With respect to you, the, the, uh, you mentioned that you have had uh, uh, some integration, some integral part, but uh, of course uh, this this kind of uh, feedback can compensate constant disturbances. But what about time varying disturbances? Yeah, time varying disturbances are no, also something complicated. Said. So yeah, yeah, they are something complicated for uh, for MPC. In this case, we are limiting the, the work to, to constant students, but we know that by adding another, maybe another type of control, that this currently, this is a second part of the work of this test. Yeah. We, we are going to, to now explore that the topic of time variant disturbances that are our, our first interest now, because it's, that's something difficult to solve, not so easy. And you also, we have considered constant speeds as references. Uh, for the simulations, yes, we are now considering constant speed. Uh, we only did some, maybe one step direction change okay. from positive speed to yes, negative you will, you, you will have to make some arrangements for time varying speeds. Yes, yeah. And we, that's what we have now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, another question? Does anyone have another question? Well, uh, I have a question. Um, wha what is the, the main contribution uh, compared to, to other works in order to highlight your, your work? What could you say yeah. that is the main difference um, of your proposal in order to, yeah. to highlight it? Yes, I understand that. Uh, in this, uh, I would say that maybe the limitation of this work um, is currently not so, so, so different from others from the literature, maybe. But our interest now, and uh, compared to all the results, is just, uh, our constraints. Uh, then our constraints are the things that we are adding. This is a, a very common problem of quadratic optimization. But applying to the induction motor, there are very few words that does it. And that's the, the reason that we are trying to, to solve this thing. And uh, the other problem that we are trying to solve now is that mathematically we can solve it in a computer in real time, but in an embedded, in an embedded application, this is going to be something difficult to solve. So we are trying to see how many times will it time will it require to solve this, uh, this optimization problem and how are we going to do it? So that's our main contribution. But this, uh, this is, for, for now, this is the first step. And we are trying to solve now this using engineering. OK. Uh, if there is no more question, we appreciate your presentation. Uh, applause for the present, for the speaker. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is going to be all for this session of uh, mechanical engineering and power electronics. Thank you all for your kind uh, attention to, to this session. Um, it's going to be all uh, for this session. Um, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good day. Thank, thank you, you. Luchito, Oscar. Yes. Uh, okay.